Okay, we're going to move on now to just working with this formula for the amount when you have compound interest. Uh, again, you can write this formula as P times the quantity 1 plus R over M raised to the N, where I is R over M. Or if you want, you can think of it like this, where A is equal to principal times the quantity 1 plus I raised to the N. And again, I is R over M. A couple things that I want to remind you of is that P is the principal, R is your annual uh, rate of interest, and then M is the number of compounded periods per year. So when you actually divide R by M, you actually get the rate per compounding period. So if you were compounding quarterly, then when you divide R by 4, you actually get the quarterly rate. So that's why I is called the interest rate per compounding period and then n is your total number of compounding periods so uh, don't don't get n and m confused m is just the number of compounding periods per year but n is your total number of compounding periods okay so let's do some preliminaries here to make sure you understand this so let's say the rate is 12 percent and you're compounding monthly for eight years well then m would be 12 because you're compounding monthly and N would be 12 times 8, because that would be 8 years times 12. So you'd have a total of 96 compounding periods. And then your rate per period, I, would be 0.12 divided by 12, which is 0.01. And so that's what you would have there. Now, if the rate was 6%, and let's say you're compounding quarterly for 50 years, well, since you're compounding quarterly, M would be 4 and n would be 4 times a year times 50 years, so that would be 200 total compounding periods, and then i would be uh, the rate 0.06 divided by 4, so that would give you a quarterly rate of 1.5%. And then uh, one more, if r was 4% and you compounded daily for 10 years, well, we would assume m is 365 for daily compounding, and then 365 times 10 years would give me 3,650 compounding periods. Again, we, we don't even fool with leap years here on these formulas. And then um, the rate would be 0.04, the, the rate per, per day. This would be your daily rate. So you would take 0.04 divided by 365 to get a daily rate of some weird decimal number. So I'm just going to leave that like that. Okay, so let's take a look at... Uh, the difference between lump sums versus an annuity. It's important that you understand uh, the difference between a lump sum investment and an annuity. A lump sum investment is a one-time investment, and an annuity is a set of equal payments. Now, we're not working with annuities in this formula, but what I'd like for you to do here is I'd like for you to just freeze the video and read these examples. So if you look at I'll just do the first pair. Here, the grandparents deposited $6,000 into a grandchild's account toward a college education. Now, this is a lump sum example, not an annuity, because there's only one deposit. So it's called a lump sum deposit of $6,000. But over here, you're making monthly payments of $500 over a 30-year period. So in this example, since you're making a payment each month, this would be an annuity. So make sure you read these. And remember, the ones on the left are lump sum examples, and the ones on the right are annuities. And I'll show you these again when we get into the annuity section. But just make sure you read each one and make sure that you can understand why the ones on the left are lump sum investments and the one on the right are annuities. So let's start with solving some basic compound interest problems. Here, again, this is that problem I just showed you. Grandparents deposited $6,000 into a child's account toward a college education. How much money to the nearest dollar will be in the account 17 years from now if the account earns 9% compounded monthly? Well, as I said before, this is a lump sum formula here. So, so since it's a lump sum, we know it's not an annuity, and that's important because we don't want to use the complicated annuity formulas if we don't have to. So since it's a lump sum investment, 
uh, first thing I want to do after I determine it's a lump sum is see if I have compounding. And obviously I do. Money is compounding monthly. So it's a lump sum investment with compounding. So more than likely I'm going to use this formula. Now let's see what I'm given and what I'm looking for. I'm actually given that they deposited $6,000 in the account. So that means they invested a principal of $6,000. It tells us that they did this for a total of 17 years. Now that's not in, that's just the number of years. The money earns an annual interest rate of 9%, I wish, huh? But anyway, 9%, we'll do it as 9%. And then um, since money is compounded monthly, M would be 12. Now since uh, M is 12 and the rate is 0.09, then I would be 0.09 divided by 12. Now I'm going to write this as a decimal because uh, it's a terminating decimal. When it's not a terminating decimal, I'll leave it in fraction form to avoid losing accuracy. All right, and then what about N? Well, remember N is M times T, and M is 12, 12 times a year, and T is 17 years. So that gives you a total of 12 times 17, or 204 periods. In this case, 204 months. Now, what we're trying to find is what this account will be worth in the future. So really we're looking for the future value of this investment, which would be the amount. Okay. So if I use this formula up here, um, I don't know what happened there. Just hang on. Let me get rid of, I'm trying to get rid of this little line here. Okay. So if we lose, use this formula up here, A equals P times 1 plus I to the N, then we know the P is 6,000, right? So the P would be the 6,000. And then we know I is 0 0.09 over 12. You can actually replace that with 0 0.0075 as I did over here. I did right here. And so you get 6,000 times 1 plus 0 0.0075 raised to the N, which is 204. And that gives you $27,551.32. So over a 17-year period, that $6,000 would grow to that amount at the end of those 17 years. Now, the importance of accuracy, let me, let me redo this problem, but let's do it with 8% this time instead of uh, 9%. And the reason I wanted to do 8% is when you take 8% and divide it by 12, it doesn't come out to a nice round number. And so, therefore, it's not a terminating decimal. So the answer, the answer you would get, you'd need to leave this in the fractional form, 0 0.08 over 12, when you put it in the formula, and you would get, you know, $23,271.89. Now, if you had approximated this, let's say you approximated this to be 0 0.0067. Well, then if you put that in there, that would be wrong, and you can see uh, what would happen you would actually be off in your answer over $150. So, you know, do not, um, do not uh, round these decimals, these fractions. Do not write them as rounded decimals. Leave them in fraction form unless they turn out to be terminating decimals like the 0 .0075 was. Now, the intention of this video was simply to show you how to use this uh, major formula here from this section. So I've shown you how to use that. So in the next uh, video, I'll show you some more examples of some things that could happen if you start changing the number of compounding periods per year.